Hi there, my name is Ron Rogers and this presentation is titled Air and Tear Flight 148 Accident, January 20th, 1992. Now, this is in an ongoing series shortly after the Airbus 320 came out. And uh, of course, Airbus had uh, claimed that the aircraft was uncrashable and monkeys could fly it and stuff like that. And they very quickly uh, were made aware that mm, maybe their, their airplane wasn't so crash proof as they had thought. And this is another um, hole in the protections, if you will. Actually, it's it's more of a hole in the flight management system. And I'll kind of talk about that because I've got an interesting relationship uh, with the development uh, and the options on the uh, mode control panel. Now, this flight was a scheduled flight between uh, Lyon and uh, Strasbourg. And the uh, it's attributed as a uh, controlled flight and train uh, accident. And they did not have a GPWS system on this. And I'll, I'll get into that uh, for an amazingly horrid reason why they, they didn't have it. But in this accident, uh, there were 96 people on board, uh, 90 passengers, 6 crew. There were 87 fatalities, but there were actually 9 survivors, which is pretty amazing, uh, the fact that this was a pretty uh, high rate of descent into the terrain. Now, as I have mentioned, the uh, the Airbus aircraft is a good aircraft. I enjoyed it. I instructed on it. Uh, but you have to respect it. You have to understand it. And you have to be properly trained. And you can't have an attitude that um, this aircraft is going to protect you. And Airbus promoted that. And that's in uh, that's a big error to promote that. Now, here we are coming in Strasbourg. And Strasbourg is in a hilly region. This is uh, the JEPS chart on the actual airport. Now, they were landing on runway 5, and there is no ILS to runway 5 because of the, the high terrain, which you can see uh, in this uh, depiction here. So what they would typically do was they'd come in on an ILS to runway 23, and they would circle around and land on 5. Well, because of departing traffic, that wasn't going to work. So um, since you don't have an ILS to runway 5, they were going to vector them uh, to the uh, VOR DME uh, for runway five and come in and land. And this is one of these typical uh, dive and drive uh, type of approaches where you select uh, vertical speed uh, for the approach. We've got this little button here where you can select vertical speed or flight path angle. And uh, you, uh, you can select one or the other. Now, um, at the time, the standard Airbus configuration was uh, a simply a two-digit display, and they selected a 3.3 uh, descent angle. And inadvertently, they uh, selected 3,300 feet per minute. Well, the only difference between the display indicating that you were doing a 3.3 flight path angle, that's the FPA there, or you were doing 3,300 feet was a little LCD period between the three and the three in this case. So if you didn't see that little period, you could mistake what mode you were in. Well, I was chairman of the ELPA uh, National New Aircraft Certification Committee, and I was on our airliner's introduction of the Airbus onto our fleet. And we were looking at a lot of aspects of, uh, of this aircraft and things that uh, we liked, didn't like, were concerned about. And there was one option on how you wanted flight path angle or descent rate to be displayed. And we said we do not like the fact that it's only a period between the two. So uh, the way it worked for us was that if you were descending at, for example, um, you know, a, a three degree glide path, it would just be 3.0. If you were sending at 3000 feet per minute, you got all four digits. So you were doing three zero zero zero. So you should notice the difference between the two. And if that would have been the situation here, um, they, they would have been, uh, they would have avoided uh, this accident. Now, another interesting thing on, on this whole accident is that they did not have a ground proximity warning system. And it, uh, 
is uh, speculated that um, they did not have this system because they were facing very serious competition between uh, France's high-speed trains, um, and the uh, Air Interior was encouraging their pilots to fly low and fast. Now, uh, you have the 250-knot speed limit below 10,000 feet. Well, they didn't want them to, to fly that. They want them to. They typically flew this course at about uh, 400 miles per hour, well above the speed. And it's kind of interesting. Um, when when I was involved in some of the early flight tests, I was uh, deadheading on uh, some of um, um, the French airliners' uh, flights. And one time I was going into Paris on an A300, and I, I'm talking to the, the flight engineer there, and I noticed that we are going about uh, uh, close to 300 knots. I mean, it was well above 250. So I, I leaned over and commented to him, I guess, oh, I guess you guys don't have that 250 below 10 here, do you? And he kind of laughed and said, well, the captain's in a hurry to get home. So they did have it, but uh, apparently it wasn't terribly enforced. But when Arantir was flying high speed at low altitudes, they uh, would get nuisance, as they called them, ground proximity warning uh, alerts. And uh, so what do you do when you have a problem like that? Well, you take the system off the aircraft so you don't get the alerts. That would have, of course, alerted them to the air. Now, the aircraft crashed into the mountain uh, 10 and a half miles from the airport at an elevation of 2,620 feet. And they launched a fairly extensive uh, search and rescue operation. Um, they had three helicopters, 24 motorcycles, 950 people from the police department, as well as 24 radio amateurs. And I find the radio amateurs interesting because I am one, uh, KC0ZN. And they participated in the search. However, it, they did not find uh, the crash site until four hours and 15 minutes uh, later. And the, uh, they were actually led to the crash site by one of the uh, surviving passengers. So here again we have a situation where Airbus is brought to the realization that their aircraft can indeed be crashed. You can't fly it with monkeys and it is not an uncrashable airplane. And one of the things that came out of this accident was realizing that um, the depiction on the mode control panel, although as an engineer, you can sit there and look at it and go, yeah, that period, you know, you should see that. But in the, the heat of the battle, um, things like this don't work. So now if you put 3,300 feet per minute as a rate of descent, it shows up as 3,300. If you put a 3.3 degree glide path in, it shows up as 3.3. And of course, you just need GPWS on uh, on commercial aircraft. That has saved so many lives. Um, there, there's just no way to get around it. And, and, and one thing that we did, um, being involved with the uh, the early on designs of these aircraft, we weren't able to influence uh, Airbus very much early on. Uh, we, we had a lot more impact on Boeing and McDonnell Douglas at the time, and that may seem strange the way things are going now, but uh, they actually uh, very much uh, appreciated our input because airline pilots fly aircraft differently than test pilots do. In fact, even airline pilots who are test pilots fly aircraft differently than test pilots. So we brought a lot, and I'll explain that in uh, some future videos about some of the things, some of the enhancements we brought, and they were they were well appreciated uh, by the the companies at the time. And of course, uh, there's been a lot of cultural changes over the years, uh, decades. Anyway, I hope you found it informative. Thanks for watching.